are certain people, often well enough liked, genial souls whom one is always glad to meet, yet who have the faculty of disappearing without being missed. Crutchley was one of them. It wasn't until his name was mentioned casually that evening at the Stuargate that most of us remembered we hadn't seen him for the last year or two. Yes, I remember. I was talking to old Crutchley at the time. Oh, he's awfully sweet. I always liked him. Wasn't it queer? He seemed to have dropped completely out of things. For the last year or two, he's been living very quietly with his people in Norfolk. Really? I heard from him only the other day, as a matter of fact. Oh, I wonder why he's chosen to efface himself. He was rather a lamb in his way. Oh, I used to adore like that him. shiny black hair of his, which always made me think of patent leather. <laughs> <laughs> it's as white as the ceiling now. Pardon? I said, it's as white as the ceiling now. Oh, no, 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 no. We're speaking of Simon Crutchley. Simon Crutchley. I mean Simon Crutchley. But that lovely, sleek hair. What, what happened? Did he have a nervous breakdown? Something like that. Biotex, the new soak and pre-wash powder presents Beyond Midnight by Michael McCabe. In this series of programs, ladies, it's our intention to talk to you about Biotex and promote it to you for the laundry. Now, we've made claims that Biotex will get rid of the stubbornness stains just by soaking... I dare say, like others, you feel a, a bit skeptical about these claims. And so we've been collecting letters from ladies who use Biotex just to quote to you from time to time in order to authenticate our advertisement. And Mrs. O'Dell from Beach Road, Sea Point in the Cape, wrote and said that Biotex is a very welcome product for the household. Biotex has a unique quality that it does what it claims to do. Mrs. Dove finished by saying, I have proved your claims about Biotex and am delighted with the results. And then a Mrs. Rita Stewart of Hans Stratum Avenue, Littleton, Transvaal, said, We have tried your Biotex for all our children's clothes and also white underclothing, and we're absolutely amazed at the change in their appearance. And I can assure you, said Mrs. Stewart, that I will be a regular user of Biotex. So, buy Biotex for yourself and your laundry. lie in the same direction. Uh, there was a method in my madness, though, Price, old man. I wanted to ask you about Crutchley. Oh. Ah, I smell a story. Yes. It's a queer and rather terrible story. There's even one bit that he couldn't or wouldn't tell. So no one but he knows what the sight was that sent him off his head for six months and turned his hair as white as snow. The night's young yet. Come to my place to have a drink. I'll tell you all I know. A driver... greatly interested in Joan of Arc, you see, and decided to go over to France to work, as it were, on the spot. I don't know if you like Rouen. Crutchley was delighted with it. He found the hotel practically undiscovered by the English and the Americans. L'Hotel d'Avignon. It stands halfway down one of those old world streets near the Gare de la Rouge en Dark. Crutchley liked it immediately and decided to stay. It was out of season. There were plenty of rooms. To the hotel, well, many ate, but few slept. Crutchy, then, had a choice of rooms on the first floor. M Monsieur? Hmm. Well, this seems. Ah. There's a little garden out here. Oui, monsieur. The hotel is very old. It is built onto the side of the hill. The garden... And the garden's a story about a street. Oh, I care for this. 
They're making much fun, will it, though? Well, that's a plane tree, isn't it? Monsieur? Yes, yes, I think it is. <laughs> it's so quiet. Reminds me of some of the little squares in the end of court. Oui, monsieur. Uh, yes, please. I, I should like this room. Uh, please arrange my luggage to be sent up. I, I'm a writer, you see, and the garden appeals to me as a place to work. It never occurred to our friend that a square enclosed on all sides by brick and almost completely starved of sunlight would be something of an unhealthy place. He was quite fascinated. The very next day, he took pen and writing materials and sitting on one of the decrepit paint-peeling seats, he started on his study of the Maid of Orléans. To begin with, his writing wasn't successful. I think Crutchley mistook the almost unnatural silence for peace. Instead, the lack of noise bred in him an indefinable restlessness. It was almost a relief to break off from his labors and go out into the little town. Crutchley had five days at the hotel, five fruitless days as far as work went, when something strange happened. It was his habit to undress in the dark because his window was overlooked by dozens of others. One night, he was smoking and stepping into his pajama trousers when he wandered over the window and looked out. Mm-hmm. 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 He looked down to the old green seat where he tried to work only that morning. With a faint, unreasonable thrill and a slight tingling of the nostrils, he realized that someone was sitting there. Hmm. It's a woman. Yes, a woman. She sat with her head turned away. One arm was thrown along the sloping back of the seat. He said that her attitude was one of extreme dejection, of abject and complete despair. When at this time of night? I can't see. I could never see her face. Not even from one of the windows on the western side. The scar she's wearing hides completely. I've been meaning to ask you for the last week. Uh, can I have a harder pillow? Monsieur? A uh, pillow. Harder. <laughs> I'm sorry, my, my French is about as good as my Lithuanian, and I don't speak that at all. A pillow. This thing here. Harder. Ah, oui, oui. Yeah, thanks. Oh, well, one more thing. Who's the lady who sits out there in the garden late at night? I mean, I, I say sits. Well, she was there last night, anyway. Somehow, though, I 
did have the feeling that she might go there often. Hmm? Uh, who is she? A uh, sort of sad-looking woman. The chambermaid turned towards the window. Our friend saw a rapid movement of her right hand. It was done very quickly. Just the touch of her forefinger on her brow and a rapid fumbling of fingers at her breast. But he knew she had made the sign of the cross. There is no lady staying in the ice, monsieur. Monsieur has been mistaken. Will monsieur take coffee or the English tea? Darling, let's go out and paint the town red. But what about your headache? Oh, that's gone. Grandpa Headache Powders did the trick. Grandpa Headache Powders kill pain, soothe strained nerves and lift depression. Grandpa Headache Powders are extra effective because they have a triple action. Grandpa Headache Powders work extra fast because they dissolve almost immediately. Get fast effective relief from any pain, all pain. Get Grandpa Headache Powders. Ah, Grandpa. Soak, soak, that's all you have to do. Soak, soak, just for an hour or two you Amazing new Biotex acts with a biological action to soak out the stubbornest stains and loosen dirt. New Biotex is great for all textiles and synthetics, whites and colors. It contains no bleach. Get amazing new Biotex today and let soaking do the washing. The wine list, monsieur. Oh, thank you, Pierre. Thanks. Are you quite comfortable in your room, sir? Mm -hmm. Oh, quite, thank you. Thank you. Uh, there is a very pleasant room in the front, sir. It's quite so big, and then there is the sun. Perhaps you like it better, sir, huh? Mm hmm? Uh, the white wine there, please. How do you pronounce it, Pierre? Uh, Le Cromertin, monsieur. Oh, a good choice. Very good. The room, sir. In the front? Uh, no, no, thanks. No, no, no. I shouldn't get a wink of sleep. You see, none of your motor traffic seems to be equipped with silencers. With trams, motor horns, and market cars bumping about all over the place across those cobbles, I should never get any peace. Very good, monsieur. Mm -hmm. I believe I'm on the trail of something queer here. The chambermaid's been talking to him, obviously. I wonder what's wrong. What they think is wrong. Crutchley forgot about it for a little while and tucked into the very excellent food they served at L'Hotel d'Avignon. When they had waited to return to his table, though, with the wine, he reopened the subject. Now, why do you want me to change my room? I do not wish for you to change your room if you are satisfied, monsieur. Well, when I am not satisfied, I say so. Uh, why do you think I may not be? I only wish for you to be more comfortable, sir. There is no sun behind the house. It is better to be where the sun comes sometimes. Besides, I think Monsieur is one who sees. The head waiter's last remark seemed cryptic, but our friend let it go. He didn't feel like discussing the sad lady he'd seen at any length with Pierre. During the afternoon and evening, Crutchley tried to work. He was incapable of concentration, though. He knew, and he was angry with himself because he knew, that he was eking out his patience until night came, in the hope of seeing once more that still figure of despair in the garden. Actually, 
felt his eagerness mingled with an indescribable fear. He seemed to hear a cry of warning from the honest workaday world into which he had been born. He said it was like starting on a voyage, feeling no motion from the ship, and then being suddenly aware of a spreading space of water between the vessel and the key. Madam, look at me. Madam, let me see your face. for a breath of fresh air before I go to sleep. That, sir, is impossible. The air of the garden is not good at night. Besides, the doors are locked and the patron, he have the keys. Hey, you're blasted insolent, that's what you are. Tomorrow I'll report you. Now get, 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 out, get out of my way. Take me for a thief because I leave my room at midnight. Never mind. I can reach the garden from my window. <laughs> what do you think you're doing, man? to enter your room with you and speak with you a little while. This is Bedlam. Oh, if you must. I do not think she is there, sir, because I am here and I do not see. Monsieur is the one who sees, as I tell him this morning. But he will not see her when he is with one who does not see. What are you talking about? Who is she? Who she is, I cannot say, sir. And the head waiter blessed himself with quick, nervous fingers. But who she was, I can perhaps tell you. You mean to try and tell me she's what they call a ghost, apparition, or some blasted thing? It does not matter what one calls her, monsieur. She is here sometimes for certain who are able to see her. Monsieur wishes very much to see her face. Monsieur must not see it. There was one who looked five years ago, and another perhaps seven, eight. The first he make die after two or three days. The other, uh, he is still mad. That is why I come to save you, monsieur. There was in this town a notary of the name Lebrun. And in a village halfway from here to Dieppe is a grand chateau in which there lived a lady, une jeune fille, with her father and mother. And the lady was very beautiful, but not very good, monsieur. Uh, go on. But I, I don't quite see what this has to do Monsieur, with you. You will, please. Eh bien, Monsieur Lebrun fell in love with her. I think she loved him too, better as all the others. So he made application for her hand. But he was bourgeois and she was aristocrat. He had not so very much money and the application, it was refused. And so they find for her another husband who she loved not, and she find herself someone else, and there is divorce. And she have many lovers, for she was very beautiful, but not so very good. For ten years, perhaps, she make her beauty to make slaves of men, and one he made kill himself because of her. But she does not mind. And all the time, Monsieur Lebrun, he does not marry because he could not love another woman. But a 
at last, this lady. She have a dreadful accident. It is a lamp which blow up and hurt her face. In those days, the surgeons did not know how to make new features. Oh, it was dreadful, monsieur. She had been so lovely, and now she had nothing left except uh, just the eyes. And she go about wearing a long, thick veil because she had become terrible to see. And her lovers, they no longer love. And she have no husband because she have been divorced. Then? What? What happened? You mean... She's the so, one... Monsieur Lebrun, he write to her father, and once more he make offer for her hand. The father, he is willing because she no longer very young and she is terrible to see. But the father, he's a man of honor, monsieur, and he insist that Monsieur Lebrun see her face before he decide if he still wish her in marriage. So a meeting is arranged and her father and her mother bring her here to this hotel. The lady come with them wearing her thick veil. She insists to see Monsieur Lebrun alone. So she wait out there in the garden. Love huh? is not always what we think it. Perhaps Monsieur Lebrun think all the time that his love goes deeper than her beauty, and when he see her dreadful, changed face, he find out the truth. Perhaps when she put aside the veil, she see that he uh, flinch. But Monsieur Lebrun, he walk out alone, and she stays sitting on the seat down there. And presently her mother and her father come, but she does not speak or move. And in her hand they find a little empty bottle, monsieur. She... Oh, my... Well, all her life she lived for love. Le Brun is the last of her lovers. When he no longer love, then that is the last of everything. She had bring the bottle with her in case he does not love. So... It happened a long time ago. And now perhaps, monsieur, understand why perhaps it is better he sleep in the front of the building tonight and change his hotel tomorrow. But why does she come back? Uh, how do we know, monsieur? She's a thing of evil. When her face was lovely, while she lived, she used it to destroy men. Now she still uses it to destroy, but uh, otherwise she has some great evil power which draw those who can see her. They feel they must not rest until they have looked upon her face. And that face is not good to look upon. Ah, another drink handy, old man? Uh, no thanks. L listen, that can't be all. <laughs> Poor old Crutchley. Uh, but that can't be all. No, it isn't quite all. I wish that it were. Crutchley was scared. He changed his room and the next day he moved out. He went to another hotel, tried to work but couldn't. The horror of the thing had a fascination for him. And the next night, as it started to get dark, he asked himself why he shouldn't go and look. He was compelled. Why shouldn't I go and see? It couldn't hurt me. Not if I look from a distance. He didn't realize that she was drawing him, drawing him to her. He went to the hotel, Hotel Devigno. He walked around the building twice and then walked straight in through the swing doors as if he still stayed there. He went to the first floor and found one of the doors that led into the walled garden. It was late and the door was unlocked. He just stood there, staring in horror at that which sat upon the seat. He was drawn like a moth to a candle flame. Madam? Please, go 
look at me. Adam, let me... Let me see your face. Adam, please look at me. Adam, I know your story and I pity you. Allow me to see your face. He was lost. He knew it. The power was too strong for him. He bent over her. left in her face. But it wasn't just that. It was something much worse, much more subtle. Something happened, I know, before his sense left him. Poor devil, he couldn't tell me. He's getting better, though. Nerves still in shreds, of course. And he has one or two peculiar aversions. What are they? He can't bear to be touched or to hear anybody 